Hi, Movement Church. We'll go ahead and grab a seat, and we're going to be turning to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to be in verses 28 to 30, Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. And as we're spending time together over the next few weeks, we're exploring this idea of a beautiful heart, the idea that Jesus and his heart is what compels us to relationship with him. And so what does it look like for us to explore the idea of what Jesus' heart is? And as we explore this text today, this is the only, the only time in Scripture, the only time in the four Gospels where Jesus himself shares his heart with us. What I love about this series is it's a reminder that Jesus is not a set of propositional truths. He's not a set of theological beliefs that you agree in but he is a person that we are called in a relationship with. And as we are called in a relationship with him, it is our joy and our privilege to understand his heart. And as we dive into this, my question and my thought is maybe even a little bit deeper than saying, who is Jesus? But asking the question beyond who is Jesus, what is Jesus's heart? That you come to the core of who Jesus is, as you come to the essence of, of who Jesus says he is, then what is the very core of who he is? Because we know that from the heart, everything else flows. My hope is that as we go through our time together today, that the Holy Spirit would be working in our hearts. As John chapter 14, verse 25 says, Jesus leaves his disciples and he says this, These things I've spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. And so the idea is that not only would you hear the words of scripture, but the Holy Spirit would visit you in a special and specific way that he would illuminate to you the truths of what Jesus thinks about you and what Jesus's heart is for you. Because here's the beautiful news. It is that the Holy Spirit is the messenger for how Jesus feels about you. In the same way that when Holly and I, when we were apart over summers, the way that I learned of her heart for me is that we would send letters back and forth, and those letters would be a reminder of one another's heart. And in that same way, the Holy Spirit shows up and he shares with you the heart that Jesus has for you. And so we commune not just with one another, but with the Holy Spirit today as we ask this question, what is Jesus's heart? As we explore Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, I want to talk to you from this title, Gentle and Lowly. Gentle and Lowly. Because there are many narratives in Scripture about the heart of Jesus or about his interactions with people, but there's only one specific area where he shares with us his very special heart. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, Father, today we ask that you would illuminate by the power of the Holy Spirit a new understanding of the beauty of the heart of Christ. That, Lord, as we know, there are many things that we could worship today. Uh, there are many things that we could give our attention and our time to this morning that we spend this time attuning ourselves to your heart because we know that in your heart there is fullness of joy, in your, pr in your presence that there is pleasures forevermore. And so we bring ourselves before you and we ask, Lord, that you would display your heart to us and we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen, amen. I want you to think for a second to me about this morning. Uh, maybe for those of you who ate breakfast this morning, I want you to think back to you eating breakfast in this very, just, this very nominal moment, this moment that you've gone by many times before. And I want you to think and ask yourself this question, what if I played a different soundtrack over that moment? And so I want to give you an example. Is this on, Andy? Is this, uh, is this keyboard on? Okay, I'm not very good at playing piano, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the soundtrack for what this morning could have sounded like for you. So you're going through, you're eating your breakfast, and I want you to imagine that you hear this soundtrack underneath your breakfast. Or maybe a little better down here. 
right? <laughs> wow. All of a sudden, your breakfast goes from like, this is great. Like, I love this. This is just like another good morning to like something's going to happen. I, like, I don't know what's, like, Siri, like, shark going to jump out and grab me for my Siri. I don't know. But all of a sudden, what happened? The thing that happened did not change, but the soundtrack that you had underneath it changed. And what happens, I think, many times in our spiritual life is that we experience these moments. And as we experience these moments in our lives, we have a soundtrack that is playing underneath those moments. For some of us, there's a soundtrack of anxiety, that whatever we're going through, we feel anxious underneath as if there's always something about ready to get us. And so there's kind of this undercurrent of anxiety in our lives. For some of us, there's this undercurrent of joy that we just feel like in every moment, man, we're just knowing this is our best life. This is our best moment. But as we come to the understanding of Jesus, every one of us is a soundtrack that we have playing underneath Jesus. And for some of us, we grew up that whenever Jesus comes on the scene, we hear, Jesus is coming to get you. He's going to come and the world is going to end. Right? There's this, there's this thing underneath that we think whenever Jesus shows up, we're in trouble. That there's somebody who he's going to like smite or that somehow he's going to come and we're going to feel bad about ourselves because of who Jesus is. But how many of us know that that's just simply the soundtrack we're playing underneath Jesus? But Jesus today wants to invite us to a different soundtrack. He wants to invite us to a different way of seeing him that is based less on how you grew up and what the pastor said about him growing up, about how he was going to watch you, how he was going to get you, how he was going to make sure that, you know, he's going to send you a place someday. And so you better be ready because when the rapture comes, there's going to be some of y'all who make it and the rest of y'all are just going to see these clothes lying on the ground in a pile. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'll never forget when I was growing up. Um, literally, I was like, my mom was reading me the Left Behind books. And, and so I woke up, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up in the middle of the night, thought to myself, it's happened. And so I got on my bike, I rode down the street yelling for my parents, came back into the house, went upstairs, saw them in their bed and thought, I didn't miss it, went back to sleep. That was one of those moments. Why? Because the soundtrack behind the scenes was this Jesus is gonna get you. But as we come to the idea of scripture, I think that he gives us a very different picture of his heart. The, uh, the preacher, Charles Spurgeon, gives us this insight that one day he said this and asked this question to God. He asked this question, what can I do to glorify the Lord my God, who has been so gracious to me and has so prospered the work committed to me and my brethren? And so he says this, he says, he feels like God says this, if you would preach sinners to Christ, you must preach Christ to sinners. For nothing so attracts the heart of men as Jesus himself. The best argument to bring sinners to believe in Jesus is Jesus. Has he not already said, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me? Then he said, but what shall I preach concerning Jesus? And my soul replied, Preach the loving heart of Jesus. Go to the center of the subject and set forth his very soul, his inmost self, and then it may be that the heart of Jesus will draw the hearts of men. What Spurgeon is encouraged by is he's saying, listen, what should I preach? And Jesus says, preach myself, glorified. And he says, well, what should I preach about it? And he says, preach of my very heart. You see, the Bible's an interesting thing in that the soundtrack that you lay underneath it, you will surely find. But as you come to Scripture, the overarching theme that we see is that God desires to dwell with us. As we come to the very first pages of Scripture, what do we see but the very condescension of God to men? What does that mean? That God himself who is for all of eternity satisfied in who he is, perfect in glory and power. The opening passage of scripture, what does he do? But he creates, he condescends from on high, and he actually begins to dwell with God and man. And so from the very beginning of the pages of scriptures, what do we see but this beautiful condescension of God to be with you? 
as we come throughout Scripture, what we see over and over again is that God shows up on the pages of Scripture. Why? Because he desires to dwell with humanity. And what more so and what greater moment do we see than the moment in the Gospels where it says that God took on flesh and dwelt among us. And all of a sudden we see the ultimate condescension of God from on high to this moment to be with you, to dwell with you because he has grace upon grace. And it's this passage that gives us the insight into why he did what he would do. He's gentle and lonely in heart. Dane Ortland, one author, says this. In the one place where the Son of God pulls back the veil, lets us peer way down into the core of who he is, we are not told that he is austere and demanding in heart. We are not told that he is exalted and dignified in heart. We are not even told that he is joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim is that he is gentle and lowly in heart. So as we come to this passage, I think it's only best that we explore these two ideas of gentle and lowly. As Jesus says this, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And so what does it mean for Jesus to be gentle and lowly? Well, the best way for us to really define that is to go into other places in Scripture where we see those terms and to simply look at those terms, the way that they're used, and then see how Jesus is applying it to himself. And so in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus says this, Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Matthew chapter 21, verse 5, he says, Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle, and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, it says, But rather, what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of greater worth in God's sight. And so in these three passages, what we see is beginnings of a definition of what it means that Jesus is gentle, that he's somebody who is humble, as somebody who comes before and requires something of the Lord, as we see in the Beatitudes. We see that he's somebody who is humble in the way that he approaches us, that he does not come in as a king on a, on a horse, but he comes in as somebody who is on a donkey. And we see that he is a gentle and quiet spirit. So you begin to put these together, and Jesus, rather than being, being somebody who is finger-pointing at you, waiting for you to mess up, Jesus shows up as somebody who is gentle. But him being gentle I, by no means means that he is weak. As a matter of fact, it is his strength that shows his very gentleness, as you would imagine a sumo wrestler holding a child. Right In that moment that the sumo wrestler is holding his baby, holding his child, does he have absolute power in that moment? He does, but it is his gentleness that shows in the midst of his power as he holds his baby. And so in the same way, we see God who has absolute power, but in that power, in his gentleness, he comes to you. And so we begin to see that he is gentle. And we see that he is lowly. This idea of lowly is illuminated in a few different passages. In James chapter 1, verse 9, it says, let the, humble, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in exultation. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In these passages, what we see is that Jesus has not come to the intelligentsia, to the people who are well-established, to the educated, to the kings. He doesn't simply show up to the people who have all the power in the world, to the Elon Musk and the Jeff Bezos. He doesn't show up to the people who have all of the money. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when he shows up, he shows up to the lowly. He shows up to those who are in need. And it's in this gentle and lowly that we begin to put together a heart picture of Jesus. This past weekend, I had an opportunity to be able to see my wife and daughter go to swim lessons for the first time. And so lively, she just turned one year old. And so I could see her. She's in her cute little bathing suit, and she ran out. And, and I could see them. I had to watch from afar behind a, a little plate of glass. And as I was watching them, what I noticed is that Holly, as they were approaching the pool, didn't simply pick lively up and throw her into the deep end. 
She didn't give her tough love, right? She wasn't like, you got to figure it out sometime, lady. Like, get in there, right? No. As she approached the pool, you could tell she was holding her in her arms. And she slowly kind of dipped Lively's hand into the pool. And she slipped, uh, dipped Lively's head into the pool. And she was holding her the whole time. And you could tell throughout the whole process, there was a gentleness about her. That as Lively was encountering this for the first time of swimming, that you could tell that it was the very heart of Holly that was with her in that moment, just caressing her as she was having this incredible moment with her mother. And in that same moment, I saw her lowliness in that she didn't just simply say, here's the pool, good luck, but she actually entered into the pool with her. That it seemed maybe to Lively in those moments that she was swimming. Maybe she was very proud of herself, thinking that she had accomplished so much. But what she didn't realize, that, that Holly had entered into the pool with her and that her, her arms were underneath Lively the whole time. And as Lively was in there, that Holly was lowly with her in the pool, holding her up in every moment. And as Jesus in this passage is displaying his very heart to you, what is he but gently, gentle and lowly? Entering into your brokenness, entering into your life. And he doesn't stand back and say, I, I knew that you couldn't do it. I knew that you couldn't measure up. No, he enters in with a gentle spirit. Dane Ortland said, says this, the posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. And it's that Jesus, the Jesus that tells us his heart is gentle and lowly, that I have to come back to over and over again because what the world has told me is that I will never measure up. What the world has told me is that I'm not good enough. What the world has told me is go fix your stuff and then come back when you're fixed. And what Jesus says, which is so uh, so contrary to the way that I see the world is he says, in that very moment, in the very moment where you are most broken, where you are most hurt, where you are most in pain, it is in that very moment when my heart goes out to you. And he says, come to me because I am gentle and lowly. And it's the heart of Jesus that all of a sudden begins to come into view because the same Lord who was resplendent in glory is the same Lord who descended to be born in a stable, gentle and lowly. The same Lord who was worshiped for all eternity past, grew up in a humble carpenter's shop, gentle and lowly. The same Lord who formed the universe is the same Lord who washed the disciples' feet as a gentle and lowly Lord. The same Lord who is powerful is the same Lord who bears your burdens and who purges your sins gentle and lowly. But I guess the question that I would have is to this gentle and lowly Lord, who can come? That sounds very inviting, but it surely must be the people who have figured it out. It surely must be the people who know Greek and Hebrew, and archaeology, and who are great expositors of scripture. It must be the people who have coming to church, the kids who are all in a train with the, the, the lace and the doilies and the hair things. And surely my child who comes in yelling and punching people could not be the kind. And yet in the midst of that moment, hear the words of Jesus of who can come and who is qualified. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. All of a sudden I approach Jesus. Are you sure? Are you sure that the very thing that qualifies me to come to the one who is gentle and lowly is the fact that I labor and I'm heavy laden because I feel like it should be the opposite. I, oftentimes I feel like, man, the people who labor, that it should be the people who don't labor. It should be the people who aren't heavy laden, the people who don't understand. It should be those people. But I want you to hear today that the invitation is for those who labor and are heavy laden. The invitation are for those who are tired. The invitation is for those who are sinners. The invitation is for those who are imperfect, those who are weak, those who are failures, 
those who are desperate, those who are filled with sorrow. And to you, Jesus says, that's the very thing that qualifies me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, sometimes I think what we end up doing is we preach a message of exclusion. That we say there are only a select few who can come to Jesus. That only if you grew up in the right family, only if you have the right amount in your bank account, only if you have the right number of followers on social media, only if you have your life together, that there is a gospel of exclusion. That we show up in church and they say, oh, you don't look the way you should. You, you'd struggle with sins the way that nobody else really here does. You, you don't understand. The rest of us, we're fine. We have it figured out. That's the gospel of exclusion. But the gospel of Jesus is a gospel of embrace. That he shows up and he says, come to me. Which is a hard invitation, if I can be honest with you, because I don't really understand it. Because I end up chasing down other ways. When, when I'm wondering and when I'm feeling like I'm burdened and heavy laden, I go to entertainment. I'll start scrolling. I'll scroll through my phone. and I'll, I'll Honestly, I took Facebook off. I have, like, no social media on my phone. I'll just open it up. I'll look through my apps. I'm not even looking. I'm like, what kind of apps I got on here? It's, it's the worst. Like, it's not even entertaining in the slightest. And, you know, I'll go to it. I'll go and I'll, I'll watch television. Or I'll, I'll start to numb myself to the world around me. I'll start to build up walls to the people around me. I'll go to other relationships to try to say, well, listen, can, can, I don't know. How do I begin to process through this? But in the very place of my brokenness, Jesus said, Says, that's the very place you're embraced. And so he says this beautiful word. He says, come to me, not you who are qualified, not you who have it figured out, not the elect. He says this. He says, come to me all. I wonder what it would look like if the message of the church would be come to Jesus all. Maybe somebody would ask, well, what of the doubter? Christ would say, come to me. What of the sinner? Christ would still say, come to me. Or what of the sexually immoral? Christ would say, come to me. What of you who are anxious? Christ would say, come to me. What of you who are wounded? Christ would say, come to me. What about you who are just kind of trepidatiously approaching Jesus because you're not sure what he's going to say to you? He would say, come to me. To me, and I will give you rest. Which on the surface kind of sounds a little bit like the gift is rest, right? I will give you rest, you will find rest. But what we don't realize about this passage, what I don't realize many times about this passage, is not simply that I will receive rest. Rest is a second thought. It's the afterthought, a byproduct of the true gift, which is Jesus himself, as he says, come to me. I am gentle and lowly. In heart. And so all of a sudden we see Jesus in a new way and we begin to say, I'm, I'm starting to see it. Maybe I'm, I'm starting to feel like some of the fog of how I saw Jesus in the past is starting to lift. Maybe some of the soundtrack of how I saw him in the past is starting to lift. But the question is, well, listen, does that just mean that Jesus is like our divine caddy? That we just like throw all this stuff on him and he just like carries it for us. And, and you know, he's carrying our burden. And, like he's just back there. Does that, is that really all that it means? And, and the truth is no. The truth is that he actually invites us to learn from him, to take his yoke upon us and to learn a different way. A way that is different from simply those who are trying to accomplish as we see the Pharisees so often do. In Matthew chapter 23 verse 4 it says, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. And what we see is this invitation to Jesus is an invitation to learn from him, to come to him and to say, what is it about the way that you see the world? What is it about the way that you see my sin? What is it about the way that you see the kingdom of God? And how am I called to live into this new way of life? And it's when we come to him for him, to see him in a new way, that all of a sudden the teaching, the yoke that was heavy that we learned growing up that said you have to be good, just be better. That's so often what I felt myself saying, and I would, I would go through all these things. I'd be like, just Matt, be better. 
Just like stop doing those things and just be a better you. Like just try harder. And this invitation of Jesus is not be better or try harder. It is come to me, take my yoke upon you. And the yoke is to love God and to love one another. The beautiful message of the gospel is not simply just go try to love God and to love one another better. The message is when you see the one who does, you'll be changed so that you do. When you see Jesus who is love, when you see Jesus who is compassion, when you look on him, now you can't help but be changed from the inside out. That's not to say that Jesus is a pushover. Because Jesus, just a few verses earlier, is confronting those who are religious, confronting those who will not repent. And they receive a Jesus who is a little bit different It's almost like this. It's almost like if I were to walk into this room and if you were to notice that I had a gash on my arm that was open and bleeding, and if I was just ignoring it, I was playing drums, and and you're like, man, that's gross. You know, like there's like open sore. I'm like up here and I'm preaching, and I just, I'm pretending it's not there. The most kind thing that you could do is to come up to me and to say, hey, listen, there's a gash on your arm, and it's infected. And if you don't go to a physician, you're going to be in trouble. And if I look at you and I say, man, you don't even love me. Just love me for me. Don't, like, come up and feel like you got to fix me. You would say, well, listen, I do love for you, for you, but there's something that you need to know, that there's a wound. And that's what Jesus does. He comes up to you and he says, listen, there's something you need to know, that the woundedness of your soul will separate you from God for all of eternity. Not that God is pleased by sending you into a place that is apart from him, but simply that he gives you over to what you already wanted, which was not him, which means that you don't get joy and you don't get peace and you don't get the goodness of the creator who lived and died for you. And so Jesus goes to those people and he says, repent. And so there is a message that comes from Jesus that says, repent. And when you repent, the Jesus that you get is gentle and lowly. It is a Jesus that will receive you, but he is not someone to be trifled with. He's not someone that we just simply craft to whatever we want him to be and however we want him to be in our own imaginations according to our society. No, that Jesus is weak. Jesus is strong and powerful, and he calls us to repentance. And when we do, We come to one who is gentle and lowly in heart where every longing of our soul is fulfilled and where we are transformed. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. The beautiful news is that as we behold him, we are transformed to be like him. That the more that we see the Savior who is gentle and lowly, who is loving, who meets you where you are at, we can't help but be changed and transformed. So the message today is not go figure your stuff out so that you can look more like Jesus. The message is when we simply come before Jesus and behold him, you will become more like him because his divine life and presence will flow through you to be a different kind of person. Charles Wesley penned these words in the hymn, all loves divine, all loves excelling. He says, love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou And what Charles Wesley saw and what I fell asleep to last night pondering and trying to figure out what in the world it means is when he says, Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. I thought to myself as I was trying to get ready for today, thinking I by no means can do justice to what this passage has to say. I can by no means even begin to help uh, tear back the veil of what many of us have seen of Christianity. But yet I went to sleep saying, Jesus, thou art all compassion. That in my wretchedness, there's compassion. That in my brokenness, there's compassion. 
that the things that I've done in my past that trouble me or the things that I wish that I would have done in my past that trouble me, though the accuser of the brethren comes in and begins to whisper in my ear, you'll never be enough, you'll never be free, you'll never be good, God will never love you. Though the accuser of the brethren comes in and begins to whisper those lies into your ear, we can say to ourselves, compassionate he is. We can say to ourselves, pure, unbounded love, thou art. And so let all excuses be laid aside. I'm not worthy. Jesus says, come to me. I'm a sinner. Jesus says, come to me. I'm not whole. Jesus says, come to me. I'm addicted. Jesus says, come to me. I'm a hypocrite. And even to the hypocrite, Jesus says, come to me. All are invited. So I invite you to stand with me as I read this passage one more time. The beautiful news of Jesus. The heart of Jesus Christ. He says, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, we ask that we would see a Jesus as he is. Not a Jesus as we've been taught for some of us. Not a Jesus that we have come to fear. Not a Jesus who is austere and demanding. Not a Jesus who has a finger pointing to us. Not a Jesus who, as we walk by, turns his head away. But a Jesus of embrace. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate to our hearts that we might see you as you are. Lord, I pray against the areas where the enemy has had a foothold in our hearts and lives because we've listened to lies. As some of us have listened all our lives to lives, to lies that say you're not good enough, you don't measure up, nobody loves you. We've listened to lies that say that addiction is the only way that we can feel something. We've listened to lies that say you are what you do. We've listened to lies that, uh, that have said that there is no way that God could love us. And so, Lord, we pray right now that, Lord, rather than listening to the enemy, that you would give us new ears. That we would listen to the words of the Savior that says, I'm gentle and lowly. Lord, we ask that you'd give us new eyes and new sight. That, Lord, rather than seeing you as somebody who is far off and distant, rather than seeing you as somebody that uh, maybe reminds us of somebody that they told us something or they thought something of us that it always felt like our father, it always felt like our mother, it always felt like uh, whoever that was was distant from us, that, Lord, instead you would give us new sight. New eyes to behold you wise to know that the gentle and lowly Savior is right there, always inviting us, come to me. And Lord, I ask for your church, that Lord, as Charles Spurgeon prayed, that he would preach a beautiful Christ, a beautiful heart. So Lord, we ask that your church would preach a beautiful Savior, that Lord, as I want to introduce people to my daughter because she is beautiful to me. That, Lord, we wouldn't feel like we have to introduce somebody to you, but, Lord, that there's a compulsion to you because we want to introduce someone to the beautiful heart of who you are because we've encountered the incredible Savior of the world who condescended to us in these moments to meet us where we are. And, Lord, I ask that we would get a new vision of you 
that, Lord, as we receive a vision of you, as we spend time with you, as we long for you in the secret place, that, Lord, you would give us new eyes to see you. And that as we get new eyes to see you, that, Lord, we would behold you as you are. And just like Moses, whose face was glowing, and as scripture says that we are going from glory to glory, so in that same way, Father, that as we spend time with you, beholding you, that we would go from glory to glory, that we ourselves might be found as people who are gentle and lowly, that God, rather than being a people of exclusion, that we would be a people of embrace, and that, Father, we would see the world, we would see people differently, not because we are simply trying to strive in self-discipline to be better, but because we have beheld the one who is perfect in beauty and splendor. Lord, would you give us a new picture of